Today we're out here in the forest with the RAV4 that is theoretically designed for exactly my demographic. I live down a mile long gravel road, the same road that you see in all of our video reviews, and theoretically this suburban or rural lifestyle is exactly what the RAV4 Adventure is designed for. We have increased ground clearance, we have a different all-wheel drive system with a different axle in the rear, making this the most capable version of the RAV4 currently available in America. The RAV4 Adventure is also a top-end trim of the RAV4. At $33,050 starting, this is second only to the limited trim in terms of its base MSRP. That puts this in somewhat direct competition with interesting options like the Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk. Although the RAV4 and Adventure are similar in MSRP, they're quite different kinds of vehicles, as we'll talk about a little bit later in this review. Up front, the Adventure gives us a different look than we see in the rest of the RAV4 lineup, and I have to say, I think, the most attractive front bumper in the bunch. There are three basic different looks up front. There's this one right here, which borrows an awful lot from Toyota's truck line. We then have the XSE version of the front end and the XLE version of the front end. Let me know which one you like down there in the comment section below. As I have said in previous videos, we've actually ordered an XLE hybrid RAV4 to do a long-term video review series on, and I'm casually wondering if it would be possible to graft on the RAV4 Adventure bumper onto that hybrid model. The RAV4 Adventure is a little bit longer than the other versions of the RAV4 because of this bumper design. It sticks out just a little bit more. You can see that we have fog lights down here. Again, full LED headlamp modules, and then some sort of go anywhere looking scuff plates at the bottom, but they're not metal or anything like that. These are all just plastic components. The RAV4 Adventure does not give us skid plates like we do find in some other off-road vehicles. Much like the earlier generations of the RAV4, this generation has become a little bit more boxy and a little bit more truck-like. As I said, the RAV4 Adventure is a little bit longer than the regular versions of the RAV4 at 181.5 inches long. It's a very slight stretch, but most of that difference is right up there in the front bumper. We don't get any extra room on the inside. That puts the RAV4 very firmly between something like a Hyundai Tucson on the shorter end of the scale and the Nissan Rogue and Tiguan at the top end of the scale. Moving to the rear, we find combination tail lamps, which means we have LED and incandescent elements in these modules. They stick out from the body a little bit as well. We have a fairly vertical section of the hatch right here, which helps improve cargo practicality overall. Even though this cargo area is a little bit smaller than some, it is still one of the most practical in this segment. We have a pretty low entry point to that cargo area and dual exhaust tips at the bottom as well. Now for an off-road focused model, these exhaust tips strike me as a little bit unusual because they're pretty low and they hang down from the the vehicle a little bit more and that does affect your departure angle if you did want to take the RAV4 Adventure a little bit off the beaten path. The last generation RAV4 was pretty close to the ground, but things are very different in this generation of the RAV4. We now have 8.4 inches of ground clearance in most versions of the RAV that you'll see on the dealer lot. And if you get the Adventure or the limited trim like this one, it'll bump it up to 8.6. That's within one tenth of an inch of what we see in the Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk, and definitely above what we see in most versions of the all-wheel drive Cherokee. And if you get the front-wheel drive Cherokee, it's significantly closer to the ground than any version of the RAV4. Toyota recently announced that there's going to be another off-road version of the RAV4 Adventure, the TRD Pro version. It's going to get the same engine as this. All-terrain tires are going to be the biggest change. No additional ground clearance, no skid plates, the same bumpers that we see in this model, and then some very slight styling tweaks to the wheels, the roof rails, etc. But in essence, the TRD Pro just builds on what we see in this RAV4 Adventure. Under the hood, we find the same engine that we see in most of the Toyota Camrys out there. It's a brand new 2.5 liter four-cylinder direction engine. It produces 203 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque. You cannot get the Adventure model with the Toyota RAV4 hybrid system. This engine is mated only to an 8-speed automatic transmission, and all-wheel drive is standard in the Adventure model. The high-end all-wheel drive system that we see in this RAV4 functions somewhat like the Honda and Acura super handling all-wheel drive system that allows the vehicle to send power mechanically from the right to the left side of the rear axle only. So it has no limited slip or torque vectoring functionality on the front axle, that's just on the back axle. That means that up to 50% of engine power, assuming no wheel slip, can be sent to a single rear wheel. This vehicle does not overdrive the rear axle like we see in the Honda and Acura systems, that's why it cannot send as much power to the rear axle as those alternative systems can. But this is very unique in the compact crossover segment because nobody else out there has a system like this. 
In our front seat comfort score, after having spent a week in the RAV4 Hybrid and now a week in the Adventure, I'm going to have to bump these seats up to 9 out of 10 points. These are some of the most comfortable seats available in this segment, especially for long highway journeys. Now, they're not as adjustable as some of the seats out there. We only have a two-way adjustable lumbar support, for instance, but we do have a pretty decent range of overall seat motion. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion as well. I'm going to have to drop one point off of these seats for the fact that we don't have that four-way lumbar support and the fact that we don't have a power passenger seat either. Hopping into the back seat, overall comfort of the seat cushions themselves is very comfortable, but we find less legroom back here than in many of its direct competitors. 78.8 inches of combined legroom. You'll definitely notice the difference in something like a Nissan Rogue or a Volkswagen Tiguan. It's still pretty comfortable for me at six feet tall sitting right there behind myself. I'm gonna have a little bit less legroom if I move all the way over to the right side. This front seat's all the way back in its tracks. You can see that's still definitely acceptable, but the big difference is gonna come in when you want to try and put child seats back here, especially rear-facing child seats. Now, if you don't have any kids in rear-facing child seats, it's not gonna to be too much of a problem that this is a little bit smaller on the inside because again, headroom and legroom are very generous. I have about two inches of headroom and these seats offer a two-stage recline functionality. That was the most reclined and this is the most upright. The rear seats feature a 60-40 folding function, and if you opt for the hybrid versions of the RAV4, again, not compatible with the Adventure package, then they put the battery pack for the hybrid system right here under the rear seats, not in the cargo area in the back. Unlike other Toyota vehicles that have a hybrid battery pack under the rear seats, though, it doesn't seem to affect the overall rear seat headroom at all. Behind the hatch, we find just under 38 cubic feet of storage space. That puts this among the best in the compact crossover segment in America. More impressive than the overall size is the overall shape of this cargo area. It is a little bit square and a little bit wider than what we see in the Nissan Rogue, and that's why even though this cargo area is a little bit smaller, I was able to fit the same number of 24-inch roller bags back here, and they fit a little bit more easily in the RAV4 than the Nissan Rogue, to be honest. Toyota also gives us a few practical cargo carrying touches. They put the subwoofer here on the side of the rear cargo area so it doesn't take up any room under the load floor. We have a roller tonneau cover right there that can be placed under the load floor as well for storage. And then we have a spare tire under the load floor as well. Now in the Adventure trim, unfortunately, it is still not a full size spare, but at least we have one. One of the other changes for the RAV4 Adventure is that towing capacity increases to 3,500 pounds. That's 2,000 pounds above any other version of the RAV4. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that the Adventure trim has a number of option packages available, and this one has basically everything. So you're not going to find everything that we see in this video in the base version of the Adventure. We have a pretty standard sized moonroof right there over the driver and front passenger's heads. The Adventure grade features this unique trim on the seats. We have an orange stripe, a gray stripe, and some additional stitching right there. We also have a perforated center section because these seats are both heated and ventilated. Orange accents continue with the orange stitching on the seats and on the doors and dashboard. You can see we have strong shoulder designs to this overall seat. We also have pretty aggressive side bolsters for an entry in the mainstream compact crossover segment, mainly on the seat back cushion. The seat bottom cushion isn't quite as aggressive. The two-tone door design features soft touch materials in the lighter section up top and then harder plastics down below. Moving on over to the dashboard, we find sort of a three-tone color scheme going on with the charcoal upper and charcoal lower sections of the dashboard. We have an off-gray insert right here in the middle that is soft text with the orange stitching. And then we have an orange storage tray right above the glove compartment. You can see you can very easily put some of those larger smartphones in there. It's a rubbery insert so that way things don't slip around. The glove compartment is one of the bin style. I was not able to fit a large tablet computer inside. In the center of the dashboard, we have one of Toyota's latest color touchscreen infotainment displays. At the moment, this only supports Apple CarPlay, although we expect to see Android Auto coming very soon. At the moment we're recording this, however, it does not support that Android smartphone integration. Toyota has been pretty slow at rolling out Android Auto in their lineup, but it is finally starting to happen for 2019 and 2020. We still have some physical buttons on each side, so if you really don't like touch buttons like we see in some of the Honda products out there, this may be a good option for you. We have direct access to home, the mapping interface, if your vehicle supports that, that would be the factory mapping interface, direct access to phone, integrated apps as well. Working our way down the center console, we have more of that soft touch material and the orange stitching, engine start stop button, the optional two zone automatic climate control, the heated and ventilated seat controls, the lights are the same for both modes. They just turn green and orange. We have a trash control off button right there, 12 volt power port, USB interface, and then a Qi wireless charging mat in that tray below. I was able to fit a large tablet style phone right in that area. 
Behind the charging mat, we have our electric parking brake button, auto brake hold button, a pretty traditional console shifter, drive back there, sport mode over to the left, we push away from the driver for gear up. Over here, we have our drive mode buttons, eco, normal, sport, and then mud, sand, and rock, and then a normal selection right there in the middle. You can see this knob changes colors, so if I rotate it over there to rock, it's a different color. If I rotate it over to the left for mud and sand, it turns yellow. Down here, we have a snow button and then a hill descent control button. You'll see a similar control setup in all versions of the RAV4, but not all models have all of the modes we're seeing here. Between the front seats, we have two large cup holders, again, more accents going on there, a soft touch armrest, and that opens to reveal a modestly sized storage compartment. There are two additional USB charge only ports in there. The instrument cluster in this model features a large LCD right there in the middle that gives us most of the readouts you're interested in. We have a tachometer on the left, fuel gauge and engine temperature gauge on the right with orange accents again to match the rest of the interior. This display is a little bit more configurable than what we see in some of the Honda competition. We do get readouts from our infotainment system, status of the all-wheel drive system, fuel economy and eco display messages, and then we can adjust the way that some of these active safety systems function. You'll see lane keeping status over here on the left side of that display, and then the functions for the radar adaptive cruise control there as well. The steering wheel is a round three spoke design. There are no paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel, which is something that I wish Toyota would include. On the left side of the wheel, we have a button module that controls that multifunction LCD instrument cluster, a phone button, voice command button, volume up and down. And then on the right side, we have track forward, backward and mode, and then the controls for the cruise control right over here. Adaptive cruise control is standard on all models of the RAV4. You adjust the distance with this button, and then you enable and disable the lane keeping assistance with the button right below it. To the left of the steering wheel, we have another storage cubby where you could put some of those larger smartphones. This is also where we find some of the controls for the heated steering wheel, the dimmer, and the windshield wiper defroster. Out on the road, zero to 60 happens in this model in 8.8 .8 seconds. Remember that the adventure trim is the heaviest and therefore the slowest version of the RAV4. The difference between this and the RAV4 hybrid is definitely noticeable. The hybrid model that we had last week went zero to 60 in seven and a half seconds. It produces more power and especially more torque than the model that we're driving right here. It also doesn't have an automatic transmission in the way, so it can keep delivering power as you're accelerating. It doesn't have to pause as the vehicle shifts gears. Likely because of the added curb weight, braking distances took a little bit longer in this than the hybrid model as well. 135 feet in this model, 131 in the hybrid model. But when it comes to handling, this definitely feels a little bit more sorted than the hybrid model because of that torque vectoring rear axle. It can put additional power to the ground as you're going around the corners, and we also don't have the torque steer feel that we get in the hybrid model. In something like an Acura RDX, if you're at a stop, you crank the wheel all the way to one side or all the way to the other and you just floor it, you're going to get more of a rear wheel drive power dynamic of that vehicle. You're going to get the rear end pushing out. In the RAV4, because it is not overdriving the rear axle, we don't get that same kind of feel. You'll really notice that when the road starts to bend, that this cuts that corner very precisely. And that's why I'm going to give this an A when it comes to overall handling ability. There are entries in this segment that will grip the road a little bit better, but when it comes to holding that line and overall feedback, I think this does just about as well as a Mazda CX-5, and that's pretty high praise in this category. Now, depending on what you're doing, the torque vectoring ability here is going to make this handle better than the CX-5, but the CX-5, I think, has a slightly better steering feel. It communicates a little bit better about what the tires are actually up to. Off-road, the RAV4 is clearly not as capable as something like a Jeep Cherokee, which does have an available two-speed transfer case. It also has an available full locking rear differential. But the limited slip functionality that we have in this RAV4 definitely makes it much more capable off-road than any of the competitive vehicles, and that would really include something like a Subaru Forester. Currently, none of the Subaru crossovers in America offer a mechanical limited slip differential, nor do they offer torque vectoring. Both of those things we do find in this RAV4, and both of them aid in the on-road road and the off-road ability of this model. As we've seen in previous generations of the RAV4, this vehicle does have a pretty aggressive center clutch lockup and that's going to really help improve overall grip when you're starting out on slippery or surfaces, whether we're talking about a leaf littered forest like this or snow, ice, gravel, that sort of thing as well. You'll really notice that, for instance, if we were to stop here on all of these needles that are on the ground and then just floor the vehicle. We don't have a lot of low end torque here, but we also don't have any wheel slip. The overall feel of the RAV4 with the mechanical all-wheel drive system is definitely going to be different than the hybrid because we don't really get torque steer here. The mechanical all-wheel drive system helps sort that out and we still get a little bit of torque steer in the hybrid model. 
You might not think that a torque vectoring rear axle would help that much in an off-roading situation, but it really does. And we see that also in something like a Honda Pilot, the Honda Passport, etc. When you're out on these gravel roads here and you're driving the vehicle a little bit more aggressively, that torque vectoring functionality can help shift power across the rear to help keep the car in the line that you're intending to make. So you'll find yourself correcting your line a little bit less frequently in the RAV4 than in something like a Subaru Forester. Now, if the going gets any tougher than what we're talking about right here, you're gonna wanna upgrade into something else because we don't have any skid plates under the vehicle. So if we're talking about a gravel road like this where there are occasional tree branches, that sort of thing, this is going to be just fine. But you really don't wanna take your RAV4 rock crawling or anything along those lines because if a rock does hit some of those sensitive areas, you're just gonna be out of luck. The other thing that's worth noting is that once we get this out on the paved road, it is not going to feel like an Acura with super handling all wheel drive. And that had been my hope when I first heard that Toyota was putting a true mechanical torque vectoring axle in the RAV4. But that's not the case. The main reason for that is that the rear axle is not overdriven versus the front. And that is the key difference between Honda's, Acura's all wheel drive system, and everybody else's that uses this same kind of engine layout. By making the rear wheels spin just a little bit faster, it's a little bit under 1%, they can effectively send more than 50% of engine power to the rear. Without that feature in the RAV4, this will never send more than 50% of the power to the rear unless the front wheels are slipping. And then theoretically, it could send up to 100% of engine power to the rear, and then 100% to theoretically just a single rear wheel. But again, this is still gonna be much more capable, especially if you start driving this faster out on a gravel road like this. You can really see how the axle is sending power left and right here as we're powering up the hill. And this definitely has a very sure-footed feeling to it. It is definitely very confidence inspiring for a small crossover. When it comes to the overall ride score, I'm gonna give this an A minus. You can tell that Toyota's really trying to straddle the fence when it comes to tuning the ride. Giving this a ride that is supple enough to handle some of those road imperfections if you're taking this out on a more rugged gravel road or something along those lines but also still focusing on on-road performance. The reality is that most adventure shoppers, just like most RAV4 shoppers, are not going to be taking their vehicles seriously off-roading. As far as crossovers go in this segment, I really think that was exactly the right thing to do with the RAV4. This is a little bit more supple, a little bit more eager to absorb some of those bumps out there on the road than a Mazda CX-5, but it's not quite as soft as some of those other options out there. In our cabin noise test, we measured 71 decibels in here, which was half a decibel louder than the hybrid model. Some of the engine noise that we see in this cabin is obviously deliberate because you can tell by the way that the intake has been designed for the engine under the hood there, that they've designed it in such a way to help amplify and bring some of those noises into the cabin. Now, personally, I was not bothered at all by the way that this four cylinder engine sounds, but if that's something that you dislike, then you may want to look at some of the other options out there. You're not really gonna hear much engine noise when you're just cruising along on the highway or going 50 miles an hour, but if you are climbing hills like this, especially if you're driving the vehicle more aggressively, then yes, you're definitely going to be hearing more of that engine noise. According to the EPA, this model should be averaging 28 miles per gallon combined. Over a week of mixed driving, we've been averaging 24. That is a little bit disappointing as far as fuel economy goes, because I had hoped that this really would hit those loftier numbers, but it's pretty typical for a vehicle in this segment that uses a traditional automatic transmission. You'll likely get slightly better fuel economy if you choose something that uses a CVT, like a Forester or a Nissan Rogue or something along those lines. But this versus something like a Volkswagen Tiguan or a Kia Sportage, they're going to be fairly similar. Now, if you do want better fuel economy, Toyota has an excellent option for you. They have a hybrid version of the RAV4, and the hybrid version will definitely get you over 40 miles per gallon very easily in real-world driving. So you do have that option if 24 miles per gallon just isn't good enough for you. Overall, out on the road, the RAV4, I have to say, has impressed me an awful lot more than I thought it would initially. The last generation of the RAV4 was probably one of my least favorite entries in the compact crossover segment, and this new RAV4 is hands down one of the best. Whether we're talking about this adventure grade that's definitely a little bit more off-road focused, the limited grade, which is more luxury oriented, that still has the torque vectoring rear axle, that's definitely gonna cut a corner a little bit better than some of the other options in this segment, or whether we're talking about the RAV4 Hybrid, which has excellent handling ability and will give you 40 miles per gallon. And I know we talked about this already, but I have to say it again, the driver's seat in this car is very comfortable. The passenger seat, a little bit less comfortable because it's less adjustable, but this is definitely the kind of seat that I wouldn't mind sitting in for hours at a time. For 2019, the RAV4 Adventure starts at $33,050. That's about $3,500 more than the XLE Premium trim. 
The RAV4 Adventure and the RAV4 Limited are the only models that get Toyota's new torque vectoring rear axle. We will also see that, interestingly enough, in the new 2020 Highlander. If you get the all-wheel drive versions of the rest of the RAV4 lineup, then you get a pretty traditional rear axle setup, essentially the same one that we saw in the last generation RAV4. If you get any other trim of the RAV4, then you get a pretty traditional all-wheel drive system from Toyota, essentially the same sort of design that we saw in the last generation RAV. So the only models with the more capable all-wheel drive system again are going to be the Adventure and the Limited trim. Another thing to keep in mind is that the soft tech upholstery and all-wheel drive are both standard on the Adventure trim. It wouldn't make too much sense to have a front-wheel drive Adventure model. However, there are still a laundry list of features that are optional on that model. Moonroof, heated leather steering wheel, ventilated seats, the rain sense wipers with de-icer, moonroof, upgraded infotainment system, premium audio, parking sensors, Qi wireless charging, all those features that you saw on the model that we were driving, those are optional on that model. And if you were to add all of those onto your RAV4 Adventure, you'd end up somewhere around $39,000. With pricing out of the way, let's talk about what the RAV4 Adventure is and what it is not. The RAV4 Adventure is one of the most capable mainstream crossovers in America, but it is not the next level of off-road performance. And that is important to keep in mind, but it also means that the RAV4 Adventure is pretty difficult to quantify and difficult to compare. The addition of that limited slip functionality in the rear and the torque vectoring functionality on that rear axle make it much more capable than a wide variety of crossovers in America. Toyota has also been very aggressive at locking the center coupling. Depending on the drive mode that you're in, it will command an almost complete lock of that center coupling, sending 50% of engine power to the rear. That's something that we don't find in all crossovers out there. In fact, some crossover manufacturers, for instance like Mazda, with their latest all-wheel drive system, they've moved away from predictive all-wheel drive systems with permanent lockups. They've moved to more reactional designs, like we see on the new Mazda 3 sedan and hatchback, where the system won't send power to the other axle unless there is slip. So what is the true competition for the RAV4 Adventure? Well, you could see this as an alternative to something like a Subaru Forester or perhaps a Jeep Cherokee. When we take a look at the first of these competitors, you'll notice something surprising. The Subaru Forester is, in general terms, a little bit less capable off-road than the RAV4. That's primarily due to the all-wheel drive system design we find in modern Subaru models. Subaru does not allow us to command a complete lock of the center coupling, and the X-Mode system does not have as many different variety of options and uh, surface textures that we see in the Toyota all-wheel drive system. But the biggest difference here is the lack of the mechanical limited slip functionality that we see in the RAV4. There really is no equivalent on the side of the Subaru. So the Subaru all-wheel drive system can use the brakes to try and direct power around it. We'll brake wheels here, brake wheels there to send power to the opposite wheels or the opposite axle. But it has to use the brakes for that functionality. The Toyota does not across the rear axle. It can lock that center coupling, send 50% of the power to the rear, and then it can use that limited slip functionality to send power across the rear axle to where wherever it's needed. The average crossover shopper in America may never exceed the capabilities of the Subaru Forester, but if things get really, really sticky, the RAV4 Adventure is going to get you out of stickier situations. Now, I will have to put the caveat in here that tires are going to make the biggest difference between the Subaru and the RAV4 when it comes to off-road, because if you put grippier tires on your Subaru Forester, it's going to get out of stickier situations than the RAV4 Adventure with the stock tires. But again, in terms of overall all-wheel drive system capability, the RAV4 is the winner here. The RAV4 also gives us a little bit more power, a traditional 8-speed automatic transmission, so if you're not a fan of the continuously variable transmission we find in the Subaru, the Toyota is going to be an excellent option. But thanks to that CVT, the Forester does give us better fuel economy, and all-wheel drive is standard on all models of the Forester. That's one of the reasons the Forester is such a good value in this segment. It's also worth noting that depending on how you configure your RAV4, a comparable Subaru Forester may be a little bit less or an awful lot less. If we're taking a look at the top-end version of the RAV4 Adventure, the top-end touring model of the Forester is going to be about four grand less expensive. This generation of the Forester has really improved on cargo capacity as well as interior creature comforts and overall comfort, but I think the RAV4 beats it when it comes to front seat comfort especially. The Forester seems to have a little bit more room in the second row, especially if you're interested in putting child seats back there, and the cargo area in the Forester is nice and wide. We weren't able to fit any more bags in the Forester than we were in the RAV4, but it may make it a little bit more convenient depending on exactly what you're planning on carrying back there. But the important thing to remember is that the Forester is just not quite the same thing as the RAV4 Adventure because of that rear axle that we find in the Toyota. The other off-road alternative in this segment is the Jeep Cherokee, and it really is the most capable entry here. It's the only one with a two-speed transfer case. It's the only one with a true locking rear differential. 
And regardless of which Jeep Cherokee model you get, the traction management software in the Cherokee really is targeted at off-roading, which is very different than we see in most of the crossovers in America. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you have one or multiple wheels off the ground, you'll really notice that in the Jeep. Because instead of cutting engine power first, the Jeep is going to be more aggressive at using the brakes on those wheels, even if you don't get the locking differential, to try and stabilize wheel speed and help get you over those obstacles. We don't see that in most crossovers out there, because most crossover shoppers aren't going to end up in situations where you have two different wheels off the ground. If you want something that's more off-road capable than the Cherokee, especially the top-end Trailhawk version of the Cherokee, then you're going to be looking at something like a Jeep Wrangler. But that off-road ability does not come cheap. The Cherokee Latitude Plus at $31,595 is the first model that has the availability of the Active Drive 2 all-wheel drive system. That doesn't give you a locking rear differential, but it does get you the improved software package and it gives you a two-speed transfer case, which is a very unique option in the segment. So if you're really planning on doing rock crawling in your compact crossover, you're going to be able to do that in that Latitude Plus better than we would in the RAV4. If you want the next step up from there, which gives us the locking rear differential, you'll find that on the Trailhawk model, which starts at 33,945. On the surface of things, that looks like an oddly good deal, but if you want all of the gadgets and gizmos on your Trailhawk, then it's gonna end up around $40,000, more expensive than the RAV4 Adventure. Now, the Trailhawk is going to be more off-road capable, and we're gonna get more power, because you have the choice of a 3.2 liter V6 or a two liter turbocharged engine in that model. If you're going to spend every weekend going down rougher trails, then the Cherokee is going to be the better option for you. However, if you're going to do it maybe monthly or every other month, and the trails are not quite as rugged, you're not planning on doing any rock crawling, getting any wheels up in the air, then the RAV4 is probably going to be the better buy for you. Overall, the RAV4 Adventures impressed me every time I've taken it on-road or off-road, and I've had it off-road in about four different off-road parks. Uh, the Land Rover Experience in Carmel, California, strangely enough, also the launch event down in Carmel, California on a completely different event, our own off-road course out here in Northern California, and at General Sam's Off-Road Park out in Texas. The RAV4 Adventure does surprisingly well for a vehicle that is stock and also has some focus in on-road ability. But if you want that next level in off-road ability, then that's definitely going to be the Jeep Cherokee. It's not going to be the RAV4 Adventure, and it's not going to be the upcoming RAV4 TRD Pro. We don't find low-speed transfer cases in the RAV4. We don't find skid plates, anything along those lines. But again, we do have that more capable all-wheel drive system. So if you find yourself camping down a rougher trail, you're going to have to worry about it a little bit less than something like a Mazda CX-5. But it's not going to be that next level in capability overall. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And let me know what you would pick if you were shopping between these three options. The Subaru Forester, the RAV4 Adventure, and something like a mid-level trim of the Jeep Cherokee. I suspect if my money were on the line right now, it would be between the Subaru Forester for its slightly squarer cargo area and the excellent value we find in the base model, or the RAV4 Adventure, its comfortable front seats, and the fact that it has a slightly more capable off-road system. Check out those related videos, including our reviews of the Forester and the Cherokee if you haven't already done so. Head over to facebook.com slash alexnautos, find us over there, click that subscribe button if you haven't already done so, and if you want to support this channel, just click that join button down there at the bottom of this video. I'll see you next week.